Hello, and thank you for joining us. We welcome you to the World Bank's Agriculture Finance Support Facility webinar. Today's topic is on automated credit scoring using digital data. Our speaker today is Florentin Lenoir, Marketing and Business Development Director at Lendo. The webinar is facilitated by Roy Parazat, Senior Economist with the World Bank and Manager of the AgriFin Program. I'm Tamara Palmer, and I'm assisting with today's event. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to provide a quick tour of the webinar space. Participants are on mute. If you need to connect with the facilitator or tech team, please send your question through the chat box feature, which is found on the right side of your WebEx screen. The last 20 minutes of our time together will be a Q&A session with the presenter, but we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar, and we will collect and share them as time allows. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. And now a quick and formal introduction of today's speaker. Uh, Florence Nim has more than seven years' experience across various industries, business functions, and cultures. His area of expertise includes strategic business development in the cross-cultural environment, international sales and marketing management, marketing analysis, and market research. Florentin is currently the Marketing and Business Development Director for Lendo, supervising the global expansion of the company along with the management of the different offices in Americas, India, and Southeast Asia. Lendo is a software service company, helping leading, fi leading financial institutions globally make more accurate and quicker decisions across the customer lifecycle and drive higher levels of growth and profitability. Lendo transforms the use of data to access and serve new and underserved market segments. All right, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to give you that brief introduction. I'm going to turn it over to Roy Parzat now. Roy, do we have your audio? Yes, um, thank you very much, Tamara. Um, firstly, thank you to everyone for attending this. Um, we're super excited because this is a very new kind of webinar that we're doing. As I'm sure many of the people, uh, many of you guys online will realize, Historically, most of our webinars have been introductory, explaining new ideas, new thoughts, new processes, new procedures, innovations at a relatively high level, not getting into the nitty gritty. Uh, today's a bit different, and this is directly due to feedback from members who've attended previous webinars who said, while they found the introductions to how big data analytics and mobile technology can expand access to finance for clients, especially in agricultural areas, they thought people were wanting to know, how does this actually work? What are the specifics? What do we need to do to really get this to happen? And so we were very fortunate to have another conversation with uh, Lendo, and they've agreed very kindly to do two subsequent webinars. This is the first one, and the next one is next week. And they're going to look at the actual technicalities, not obviously the IT requirements, because that's on a whole nother plane, but rather, what are the kind of steps in a process to make this happen? If you're a financial institution and you want to think about, am I in the right position at this point in time to start approaching new clients with a new channel through mobile technology? What do I actually need to look for? What do I need to make sure is in place? And how do I go about this? How do I contract a big data firm to come and do this? Do I use my own data scientists? How do I actually do client take on? How do I do my KYC? How do I do my identification and verification? All fundamentally important, important factors for anyone in a financial institution wanting to offer a financial product. And so I think this will fill in many of those gaps in comprehension. It's going to be very, very interesting. I've had the, you know, the fortune to actually look at this presentation in advance, obviously, and it really is incredibly insightful, and I learned a great deal from it, and I hope you will too. Please also do not hesitate to ask questions. Use the chat box, as Tamara explained, to actually ask for clarifications, ask follow-up questions. This is a great opportunity to have one of the leaders in this space directly able to answer questions for you. And I would uh, very, very, very much recommend that you kind of uh, take up that opportunity. And also later on, if you have subsequent questions after talking to your colleagues following the webinar and stuff, revisit the site, look at the presentations, and feel free to ask further questions on the LinkedIn group that we have. Anyway, thank you. And without any further ado, I'll hand over to Flo. Thank you very much, Flo. Really appreciate you doing this subsequent presentation. 
Thank you, Roy, and, and thank you, Tamara, also for uh, introducing the webinar. Thanks also, everyone, for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, you know, out of your morning, out of your day, to uh, just uh, spend a bit of, uh, of time together to discuss this topic. Um, and so, uh, without any further uh, delay, I will just proceed with the uh, with the webinar. And, and again, feel free to ask any question, uh, any comments that you would like to share, feel free to drop it in the text box and then I will make sure to get back uh, one way or another uh, during this, this, uh, this session. So we would have, uh, for this session, we're really going to cover initially uh, just a bit of background on Lendo, but we'll go deeper into uh, the, the purpose of building features. How do we manage to build features out of non-traditional data. Um, we'll see how we do that at Lendo. We'll also see how uh, that can be applied to a, to a portfolio. We'll see how uh, it, there's a clear correlation that can be made between traditional and non-traditional data. And I'll be happy to walk you through this uh, during the presentation. Uh, we'll go also a bit around the kind of the best practices that could uh, that could help you. And we we'll end this webinar with a Q&A session. So um, to, to, start this, um, to, to, to start this webinar, so, uh, you know, in, in the recent years with the, the realization that more than three quarters of the poorest around the globe are actually living in rural areas uh, with the fact that most of small farmers, smallholders farmers uh, would be working with less than uh, Two acres of uh, of land, uh, financial inclusion really has risen to um, to become the talk of the town. Um, most of the time, those individuals would like the seed, the machinery, the livestock, uh, and the finance to actually grow. Uh, they would struggle with uh, with uh, all of those different different things to emerge out of the of, of poverty. And the current banking system has uh, clearly shown it some, somehow its limitation, focusing only on traditional uh, data and, and very conservative uh, processes to, uh, to manage to extend services to this population. So um, at the same time, something that we clearly see happening in the market is the, uh, what, what we call the emergence of the digital space. So we see that more and more people actually coming online and especially within the, uh, the uh, emerging middle class, the, that, that underserved market, uh, that uh, happens to come more and more often online, have smartphones and um, are very eager to uh, get access to new products, to cheaper products uh, and to better uh, customer service. So <clears throat> we know that that revolution really is, is coming into the market and and that's where uh, that's what Lendo saw. I would say uh, six years ago when we started that journey uh, in 2011 to really become today the world leader in identity verification and credit scoring. So when when we started, we started actually as an online lending platform. We decided to go through the process of doing lending ourselves because we wanted to prove that assumption that we could credit score individuals, we could verify their identity using non-traditional data. So for four years, we operated uh, three platforms, three online lending platforms in the Philippines, in Mexico, and Colombia. And we really went through the process of um, collecting, analyzing, uh, processing billions of data points to build predictive algorithm using advanced machine learning techniques. At the end of the four years, we were able to prove that assumption, and that's when we decided to switch business model and to really become a technology provider, which has always been our core mission, our core will, and and to help promote financial inclusion around the world. So we started working with banks, with telcos, with online lenders, uh, peer to peer uh, lenders, e commerce platforms, and so on and so forth, to help them make better decisions and faster decisions, especially on thin five clients. We now um, operate in about 20 countries, and um, we would mainly cover Latin America, India, Southeast Asia, and Africa. So really, 
the core of the uh, the emerging markets. <clears throat> so uh, today, what Lendo really has is a platform that allows to connect a lot of different kind of digital data. So there are data that could come directly from uh, Lendo. Those could be coming from social media data, from email, from smartphones, um, but they could also come from data that the partners that we work with would have on hand. And those could be internal data, demographic information, uh, transaction history whenever it's uh, available. and. And on top of that, we could also consider having data coming from third-party providers. Those are telco data, credit bureau information, and we would work on making all of those data available on a digital format so that everything can be consumed instantly into the platform that we built. So that eventually we could help uh, the partners that we work with, with assess the credit worthiness, verify again the identity, and gain really market insights. So for this session, I will really go into detail into the credit scoring piece, uh, and next week we will cover the verification part. So <clears throat> really the way the, I would say the solution work is by initially being able to capture a lot of data and a digital data that we would be able to break down into specific features and variables that we would then consume into models that we would build. And using machine learning techniques, using technology, we'll be able to automate those processes and make sure that based on the data that we collect, we can eventually return um, a strong indication of what to do with an applicant. And this would really have ultimately an impact with the, the, on, on the loan economics that the, the partners who operate with. And this is something that we, we've seen in the market and, and that is clearly known today is that the future of financial services should really be uh, digital. And we can see that by applying technology and, and to, to the acquisition uh, process to um, the onboarding process, then you would actually really uh, manage to uh, to have a strong cost reduction, and that cost reduction leads ultimately to more scalability in the offering of the the, the, the products and the services of the financial institution, which allow them to then reach out to more customer new uh, new customers and and serve those under uh, the, those new underserved markets. Now. If we look at the process of creating features, so as we mentioned, we gather a lot of different data points from the non-traditional data sources that we have. And again, those could be uh, psychometrics data, they could be social media data, they could be uh, smartphones, form feeding analytics. There's a wide range of data points that can be uh, captured at every level of uh, the application process. And so based on those data points that we collect, we would then start creating features. Um, those features would be most, um, most of the time really network based. They would be um, captured from behavioral um, uh, variables. They would be analyzed um, from our machine learning techniques and return really an indication of the willingness to repay of an individual. And by willingness, that's really the character to pay, trying to understand how an applicant would be, um, would have the right behavior that would correlate with uh, repayment behaviors. And so once we have all those variables, all those features ready and available, we are able to test all of them and see what would be the 10, 15, or 20 most predictive ones that we would be able to include into the model that we would build um, for, for our partners. Uh, excuse now, me, uh, Flo, would, would yeah. you mind uh, speaking just a touch louder into the microphone? Just in case people have sure. a poor connection. Thank you. Sure, sure. 
So, um, of course, there would be a lot of, um, I would say, statistical techniques that we would be using that are actually uh, very much used for any, you know, risk officer um, in, in any financial institution. So, those techniques um, that that we that we could classify as the Markov network um, would really be used as um, an initial approach to understand um, a portfolio and, and then how the features would actually be reacting with that portfolio. We we would be also able to use uh, additional techniques that would be um, more into the analysis of uh, the language, for example, the analysis of the metadata that we capture from from email, from SMS, uh, and so on and so forth. And so we would be able to really look at all of the different data points that we capture and that we uh, uh, that that we could consider, and then uh, and define the ones that would be predictive in the models that. Um, that we uh, that we would be building. Now uh, back to the data and the, 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 that we capture from the non-traditional data sources. What we would be really looking at again is the behaviors of the individuals, trying to understand based on again the data we collect what would be the uh, most important traits or personality traits that would have an impact when it comes to lending. And so part of the research that we did, part of um, what we saw uh, and that, that is known in the market and, and that many uh, studied also um, uh, mention is that there are really two traits that would be a key component to, um, to defining good repayment behaviors. Those two personality traits would really be around the uh, the attention to details and uh, the consistency in behaviors. And so those are the two traits that um, we would be looking at in order to really define, again, the willingness to repay of, of an individual. So um, there are a, a certain numbers of features that we can define from, from um, uh, from the data sources that that we uh, that we collect, and really, when it comes to uh, when it comes to data and digital data, um, the the most important is not really again the, the quantity, because we know we can collect a lot of different data, but mostly the quality of the data that we collect. And this is why, in the process that we have in acquiring those data, we would be looking at always getting the consent of the users, so making sure that they are fully aware that they have to share certain types of data, and and also making sure that um, we only collect the data that we need. And so that's why we would have certain numbers of features that are coming directly from smartphones, um, which are related to uh, mobile data, from uh, SMS, from call logs, from uh, the phone book, and so on and so forth. Data that would also be coming from emails, assuming this is really mainly done through a, a web channel, and and that would allow us to uh, to analyze again the uh, the email box and make sure that we collect uh, metadata around those messages. Um, and so you can see that it's, it's for example, read really the total of emails sent. It could be also um, the number of emails that they sent over the last 30 days, uh, the ratio between what was sent and was received, um, the overall um, activity of the account, I would say. So um, understand, you know, what time are they sending messages, when are they reading them, and so on and so forth. And and so for uh, we would also look at some of the features for uh, from from Facebook, uh, but this is mainly for identity verification. So this is something that we will cover again um, mostly next week. Now, how do we actually manage to build a feature? And I think this is a 
this is quite an interesting point because um, if we take a specific example like the one uh, that uh, of, of a smartphone user that is applying for for a small loan, then we would realize that the the variables that or the features that we are uh, building would really um, go from very simple to very complex, from sometimes very linear to non-linear. And one of the best examples that we would have is really around what the, the feature that we actually define as frequent contact. So in that case, again, um, the first step is always to analyze what are the data points that would be available and then define a clear uh, time frame with which we're going to uh, be able to work and, and, and that would be relevant for the for the, the, the purpose of uh, assessing the credit worthiness. So, um, so in that case, what we start, uh, the first step that will happen once we have access to those smartphone data and we are able to uh, really look at, uh, for example, the call logs, the first step would really be to analyze the ratio of incoming calls versus outgoing calls. And we know, again, by experience that Okay, a ratio of one would be good, but this alone would not really be predictive. So we'll try to dig deeper into the data we have and we'll start combining that variable with another feature that uh, this time would be the time of activity. So looking at, again, are they more active during the day or during the night? Are they more active in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening? And so we would be combining those two uh, those two features, so the number of I mean, the ratio of incoming versus outgoing calls and the time of activity. And that would then allow us to uh, start seeing signal. And especially if we really now look at how many people in their contacts um, are they actually and actively in touch with over that certain period of time, time frame that we have uh, defined earlier. And, and so how does that would impact um, with the overall credit worthiness, the overall ability of someone and, and willingness to repay a loan? And so that starts really to be, to be predictive. So this is how we would define the number of frequent contacts. So, in that case, once we really are able to combine all those three, I would say, dimensions, then we start really having a, a feature that starts to be highly predictive. And, and something that is interesting here is that the number of frequent contact is predictive but non-linear, meaning to say if you have no frequent contact at all, most likely you, not most likely, but you know, there's a chance that you actually uh, a loner, uh, serial killer, or anything. So it just um, it tend to be um, not not um, uh, credit worthy enough. And if you have too many, then you tend to be a social butterfly. And and that is also uh, preventing you actually from from uh, from from repaying your loan um, on time and every time. So. Again, these these are really behavioral traits that we look at, that we dig into, and, and behavioral features that we're building, and and that would um, really allow us to to have a clear understanding of uh, the applicants, understand um, how they, what their behavior are, behaviors are, and and how everything is. Uh, um, uh, is, is predictive for. Uh, for them to repay another loan. So uh, something that we actually saw working on different you know, portfolios, collecting data um, for, for many years is that in terms of network, uh, there is a clear correlation between who is in your network and your credit worthiness. So if you remember, because we collect a lot of uh, information from 
from email, from, from the phone, getting an idea of the phone book, then we actually get to understand how people get connected uh, with each other. And, and something that we saw clearly and that you can see here on the screen, where the blue dots are uh, actual good payers of a portfolio and the red dots are bad payers. And <clears throat> two dots being together would actually uh, reflect uh, a clear uh, affiliation, a clear proximity between those two, uh, those two borrowers. And, and what we saw in, in, in the data we collected is that there is a clear correlation again. So the good payers would attract good payers in the network and vice versa. And, and this is predictive not only on the first level, but also second circle and up to the third uh, circle. So being able to, um, to understand uh, on, a, I would say, digital format, the network of the individual also gives you a clear understanding of uh, who is in the network and, and how that's going to be uh, uh, impacting their own credit worthiness. Now, moving forward um, to, to our approach on, on, on credit scoring. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we would be able to capture a various range of digital data from the known traditional side, from social, me from social media, from um, smartphones, from um, psychometric tests, uh, from the behaviors, and so on and so forth. And we would be able to combine that with um, more traditional variables. So applicant data, credit bureau information, um, transaction history, and so on and so forth. And we would start making correlation with these, um, with all these data that we were able to collect and see how new features can be built, how existing features could be uh, integrated to, uh, to a scorecard, how could we build a new scorecard for a specific product, and, and so on and so forth. And so this would really allow us to combine both the uh, character and the capacity to pay of an individual. And this is, again, back to understanding um, the, that the uh, ability of someone to repay a loan could be as predictive as his willingness to, uh, to repay it. So by combining these two elements, we really get the two key elements that uh, are needed when it comes to, uh, to lending to define the credit worthiness. So in that case, we would really assist our uh, partners uh, to um, to maximize again the profitability of their portfolio. Now, I want to walk you through some of the case studies that uh, that that we've observed. And for this one, we really look at um, the portfolio of uh, one of the partners that we work with, where um, they had um, basically about 20% of their portfolio that would have no hit in the credit bureaus, we would um, see that they're close to 30% of the portfolios that is non-eligible because they have a low credit score, and a little bit more than 50% that would be eligible because they are above the cutoff that the financial institution has initially decided on. And um, in that case, um, we would initially focus on the eligible segment. So the segment where you have a credit bureau hit. And what we can see is that um, you know, that's good for 50% of their uh, overall portfolio. The default rate is actually not so bad at 1.46%. Uh, and um, they would... Um, they would be able to approve uh, by focusing on um, the low and medium uh, segment of that uh, specific eligible segment. So by managing the risk, they would uh, segregate the high risk and get to approve up to 41% of the, of the portfolio. So 
what we would then do is start applying a score that is based on email data to see the correlation in that portfolio between the, um, the, the credit bureau score and the lender score. And so what we can see is that there's actually a strong correlation, a strong relationship between those two uh, different scores. And the idea that we have now is to be able to combine on one end the traditional way of uh, assessing credit worthiness with the credit bureau score with the non-traditional way which is coming from uh, from uh, the lender score. Uh, working on that correlation, we would then be able to segment the population and you can see on the screen that um, at some point even in the high risk that the credit bureau has identified, you would be having different segregation with the lender score from low risk to high risk. And focusing now on uh, the section that is low risk in that uh, low risk by the lender score but high risk with the credit bureau, then we would be able to capture a certain percentage of, uh, of the population by still managing the default rate at the same, pretty much same level that uh, was initially uh, accepted by the, by the bank. So, in, in this case, what we see is that looking at a segment that um, has been defined and, and that has a credit bureau score, then we still manage to improve the overall approval rate from 41 to 44 percent while managing the default rate. And so this is also an interesting aspect to see that um, defining the key element or the key goal is very critical. Is it to approve more applicants or is it to actually reduce the default rate? So in that case, by um, increasing the approval rate while managing the overall default rate of the portfolio, then we were able to improve the overall profitability of the of, of that portfolio. And you can see uh, that it, it's actually moving from uh, 205,000 to 225,000. So that, um, in, in that scenario, you could see that um, there is a way to improve the discrimination, applying non-traditional data to an existing uh, portfolio that has um, a, a credit bureau score. Um, and we see an increase of 10% in profit and close to 8.5% in the overall approval rate. Now, we also know that in many cases, people will not have a credit bureau score and they will literally have no, vis no visibility on this segment. And this is also why financial institutions have been, re have been really uh, struggling to actually reach out to uh, to this population. So this time, by focusing on that segment, that 20% here in that portfolio, um, in the population of that portfolio, those 20%, if we look at um, applying the lender score alone, so this time there's no credit bureau score, so we would just look at the lender score and see who lender is returning as low risk, medium risk, high risk. And what we would see is that in terms of uh, default rate, then um, there's still uh, a consistent performance that is being seen throughout the whole population because you can see that the, the bad score, um, the, the, sorry, the default rate for uh, the low risk is actually uh, lower, a lot lower than the high risk as returned by Lend can see also the segregation of the population. So most of so most of the population would actually be uh, in the medium and low risk. And we would be able to identify the high risk segment as well. Now, um, what we would be doing is focusing on still managing the risk, um, this time at 1.4%, uh, then we would be able to um, to clearly approve close to two-thirds of 
those 20% that we have um, defined that had literally no credit risk, uh, no history uh, of transaction, um, and and we would then be able to uh, start serving them with uh, specific services that uh, the financial institution would have. And this is clearly, and we, we can see here um, in, in the results of the portfolio, that this is also clearly where the opportunity is. The portfolio is now jumping from two, uh, 205 to 315,000. So in, in, in that case, we would then have an increase in the approval rate of um, close to 45% and an increase in profit, which is a, a lot more interesting in the perspective of a financial institution, which is about 50, uh, more than 50%. So um, again, focusing on a segment that would normally uh, not be, I would say very much considered due to the lack of credit history, we can now assess their uh, credit worthiness and start making decisions on them. And that, that's a definitely a, a, a changing factor, not only for financial institution, but also for these, uh, these applicants that can now access um, a wide range of, uh, of services from education, health, um, housing, and, and, and also um, um, uh, stock inventory and so on and so forth. Now, um, if we just take a look at how that score, how that approach can be used in, in different use cases, then um, we would see that one of the examples uh, that, that we see, uh, one of the usage that we see, I would say, is really around managing the pre-screening process, being able to target faster uh, in, in an efficient, more efficient way, the applicants that would be most likely to um, to pass and to get access to financial services. Uh, so that's pretty much um, an approach classic, 20% um, approval rate, and and a lot of um, money uh, and and time spent in trying to do credit investigation. If we now look at removing from that portfolio that uh, population, the applicants that would have a low lender score, so that are most likely not having the right behavior to repay a loan, then we can then focus really uh, more time in, in the credit investigation on the remaining people and, and actually manage to approve, uh, to really fast track some of the, some of the applications. If another use case that we would see is in terms of risk uh, reduction. If you have a, a traditional portfolio with a cutoff uh, at a certain number, if you start applying again to that existing population a low land score, then you are able to eliminate and do a better discrimination with the applicants that um, would not necessarily have uh, the willingness to repay any loan. And, uh, and and lastly, I would say the um, just to recap, so the, the, the way we could also work with non-traditional data is by now that you have an, um, the ability to uh, access new <clears throat> new market segment, you can actually adjust some of the processes you have, some of um, the, the, the score that you use to include a new, uh, new population that cannot be uh, that can now be eligible and apply a high lender score. So in, in which case in this one, you would really focus on targeting the people that would be most likely credit worthy. And and this is how you can increase the um, the, the overall population of your portfolio. Um, if we look at um, some of the focus that we have around the world. So um, that example in, in South Korea would be uh, uh, surely also interesting. So in that case, it's, uh, it's a microcredit bank that wants to use a solution like Lendo to provide loans to low-income and uh, low-income individuals and, and groups. And they would be 
using Lendo to build a new product and to um, to have a, a new way of scoring and defining uh, the uh, the credit worthiness of of their applicants. And uh, in that case, uh, this was actually also um, supported by the uh, Google Impact Initiative that um, that decided to um, to allow the creation of that that social bank to to support access to financial uh, services for the the for a certain number of applicants that would not have normally access to and and now how could this also be fully applicable to uh, to farmers and in, in this case there's really a few a few steps that need to be uh, need to be analyzed. I think one is really around how do we manage to digitize the data that are today calculated in a very manual way. It could also be found from some of the third party providers that are not gathering those information. And those could come from you know seed expenses, from fertilizers expenses, uh, livestock revenue, plot dimension. Uh, all the personal details and again the mobile information that they have and and then try to uh, build you know really tailor-made solutions combining all the types of of data um, such as that could be weather condition that could be um, any you know soil conditions and and so on and so forth and so um, by using information that is collected from from the farmers, then we can start really looking at how that information uh, is or is not predictive when it comes to credit, uh, and and this is how by having those data available in a digital format, we'll be able to gather and, and analyze and build models that we can then deploy and and um, and use in the case of uh, of credit scoring those uh, do, those applicants. So, um, <clears throat> so this uh, so by being able to capture that information, to be able uh, by being able to capture information from from mobile, from email, we then get to um, really work with the partners to uh, help them define how to create value throughout the whole customer life cycle. Uh, part of the, um, the idea that uh, a financial institution would have is that information that they have for credit scoring will only be used for credit scoring. Something that we clearly saw is that once you have access to this data, you can actually look at creating more value across all the different steps uh, of the the customer journey, and that could be from um, acquisition perspective, from uh, customer experience perspective, from upselling, cross-selling, and and part of the work we do is really trying to help those applicants, those uh, partners, sorry, to access um, to unlock really the the power of the data they have, and and to maximize that across the 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 whole uh, customer life cycle. To help them make better decisions, um, quicker decisions, uh, to offer products that are um, that can really be on demand, and and allow them to uh, to scale their 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 activity. So, a few notes on on some of the I would say the best practices that we see in the market. It's really. Um, the first step is really to focus on um, what are the what is the goals, what's the business question that that you have and that you would like to solve for your market. And once you have that question, we can really focus and analyze what would be the data that would make sense to actually manage to reach to that um, that goal that you have. Also, we would say that it's it's important to um, to start small, to really focus on a specific use case and <clears throat> and, and to learn from it and, and to see how that can easily be scalable afterwards. But there's no 
point in trying to overcomplicate things from the beginning, trying to um, you know use so many technologies to begin with, but instead just really focus on testing, on learning, understanding what technology could bring, how technology will allow you to rethink the processes that you have and not just add another layer to all the processes that you would only uh, already work with. And so and, and that, that that's a key element to see is that we know that technology will have an impact and is supposed to be an impact on the processes that you have and and that could really come from um, um, helping you not have you know duplicated processes try to allow you to uh, save some of the uh, save time save cost so that you can really automate the processes and, and, and maximize uh, the customer experience that you have um, that's it for this presentation I would now welcome uh, any questions from from the audience so, uh, Flo, it's Roy here. Firstly, thank you very much. Uh, I learned a great deal from just listening to you go through the slides, and I'm sure that the audience have as well. I've received a volume, I mean, when I say I, uh, the team have received a volume of questions, some which you can see at the bottom, but many that have been sent directly to us. And I've kind of collated these into a number of questions. So we've got about seven or eight big questions. If possible, if we could race through them, because we've got about 12 minutes. And, uh, you know, let's kind of do rapid fire. The first one that came through was thinking about, uh, someone was saying it looks like you can reach different types of clients the banks traditionally can't. And you talked about that in terms of the financial inclusion agenda. But specifically, someone wondered whether, from your experience to date, does this technology allow you to reach younger people who historically haven't got a credit history or a credit record and people are younger people who want to set up uh, enterprises so youth entrepreneurship is this a way of kind of reaching those kind of segments that are currently out of scope of most FIs uh, thanks for the question so um, definitely there's a way to um, get an understanding of the millennial population get an understanding of how they would behave and, and, and find the, the ones that um, would be uh, most likely to, uh, to be credit worthy. One thing we mentioned, I mean, we saw also is that there's what we call the Californication of young people. So regardless of where they are in the world, the, the younger generation tends to use their uh, smartphone the same way. Uh, so, so this is a really uh, an interesting learning that, that, that we saw in the data we collected. For the um, the micro SME segment, as I would call it, there is definitely a strong correlation between the the credit worthiness of the owners and um, and the overall credit worthiness of of the <coughs> excuse me the of, of the, the the micro SME that that uh, they created. So there's definitely ways that we can use those data to build. Um, models for these two segments. Perfect. So jumping into another one now, and this is an agricultural specific one, which is, it seems to, uh, to the questionnaire that there seems to be a, a question about loan sizes and predictability of the score and loan tenors. What's the experience from you guys about the robustness of the score in predicting repayment when loan sizes are larger and loan lengths are longer because obviously in the agricultural market people borrow for seasonal inputs and that could be two three four five months and historically these may have been shorter term loans that you built your model on do you have any insights in going longer and larger sure 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 so uh, actually the the initial model we've built were on uh, la uh, size loans that were anywhere between $50 and $2,500. Uh, we also calculated based on terms that were going on tenure that were going from one month to 12 months. Um, so this is really what we would qualify as uh, small loans. We also saw a lot of um, 
work done, and today, especially in Africa, we do cover a lot of the, the, the microloans. So anything between you know 15 to um, 100, $150 um, payable within 30 days. But we also now have um, auto loans, motor loans, housing. So definitely, excuse me, definitely um, uh, products that would have longer term, that would have larger term. So in there's there's always a way to calculate that. The process of building the model will depend on the size or, and the tenure of the loans or the products that um, that you're working with. But um, there's there's always a way to uh, generate value, I would say, from day one, and then to keep improving as we collect more and more data. Perfect. Um, another question that came in on uh, someone asked on the platform is whether it's possible to use metrological parameters. And I think you covered that to an extent. But has this been done before? I know um, a project I'm managing in Myanmar is trying to use crop suitability mapping, understanding where the crops grow best and where market access gives most stability to production. But have you got any experience of factoring that into your models to date? So I would say not directly into our model, uh, as far as Lindo is concerned. But we know in the market, we saw it in the market, that uh, there are ways to capture those information mm -hmm. and, and to start um, working with it and analyzing the correlation that can be found in it. So it's not, again, it's not something that Lendo has done extensively, uh, but we, we did see it in the market. So just to clarify on that point, if a financial institution from Africa, for example, said to you, we're very interested in your model, but we want you to build in an agronomic feature, that would be something that you as data scientists could do working in partnership with that institution to identify the data, secure the data, and bring it in in a usable format. Correct. If in the if if there's a way to capture it on a digital format, we can uh, we can consume it. And we saw it with working with you know telco data and and uh, telcos would have like especially in Africa, telcos would have a, a huge role to play in the in the near future to unlock the access to financial services to uh, to a wide range of the uh, of of the um, uh, the, the emerging, uh, uh, not only middle class, but bottom of the pyramid also there. So there, there is a lot of information that can be consumed, and the, we're always happy to explore uh, every venue when it comes to data, because um, there's a lot that, that can be done, and we're only at the tip, you know, tip of the iceberg here of, of understanding clearly how that data can be used. Uh, that leads us, uh, it's a nice segue into a question that came from a number of people about the sourcing of data. People were very interested to understand who actually secures the data. Is it the financial institution? Is it the financial institution through you once they've contracted Lendo? And especially where the population haven't got smartphones, and that's primarily in all agricultural areas, rural areas are pr primarily feature phones. Who would do the logistics in terms of working with the mobile network operator? Because I can only imagine how complicated that process might get. What's your experience to date? Uh, that, that's correct. What we so we actually saw a wide range of uh, uh, of options here in the market. In uh, we've seen, for example, uh, joint ventures between banks, telcos, and technology providers to actually come up with new solutions, come up with digital banks, come up with uh, new services that would address the need of those populations. Because again, telco data are very predictive when it comes to first-time borrowers. And, um, and, and so and sometimes it came directly from the telcos working with banks. Uh, in some cases, it was um, directly through uh, partnerships between you know, uh, the technology provider and the telco to somehow find a way to, uh, to monetize those, uh, those data. And, um, and sometimes it's actually at the initiative of the telco to, uh, to allow to unlock those, uh, their own data and, um, and, and, and allow it to be used uh, for, for the purpose of financial inclusion. 
Okay, and that's super useful. But another question that's popped up is from someone saying that in some parts of the world, users don't have loyalty to one telephone number or one SIM card, I guess it would be. What do you do in those situations? Is there a way around that where someone might have multiple phone numbers and multiple phone data? Is there a way to combine them or do you just go with the primary number? We, I mean, that, that, that's a very relevant question. And, um, and we, we do have, we do hear that a lot. We would always um, foster, I would say, the users to connect their primary uh, number. Um, we have ways, as we would see next week, to verify the uh, the phone number and see if that is matching the, I would say, the um, um, the one they, they've, they've been given, and, and make sure that somehow there's a there, there's a there's a correlation here. Now, um, it th I think this is something we are still exploring. Uh, to be fair. We are facing this in several markets, but um, what's important is more to make sure that um, from the data that we collect, whether we have enough information or not. So if we don't have enough information, we could uh, invite them to, to add on a different phone number, I mean, a different uh, network they're using, uh, and so on and so forth. So this, this okay. could happen. So I, I, I apologize for the speed of these questions, but there's so many of them, I don't want to miss any. Um, someone asked a very insightful question, which is obviously you were showing how you can use credit bureau data to help you on the segmentation <coughs> approach, and that was super interesting. Someone asked the question about what do you do where there is no credit bureau data? Is it a much harder process, or are there, again, workarounds to use solely the alternative data sources without that kind of segmentation and verification process that can assist? So um, the very, actually what we saw, especially in the African market, is the ability to combine demographic information with non-traditional data. So in some cases, we don't have credit bureau data, and that, that's fine. We would just analyze what is available and how we can combine it with non-traditional data. Um, so um, what we would always recommend is not to use non-traditional data in isolation, but always try to combine it with other data sources, because once you start really uh, aggregating data and find correlation, then you are able to maximize the value of each of those data sources. And we saw that, um, there's always better performances that would come from um, combining more data. And if you can combine demographic plus, let's say, Android data plus credit bureau data, most likely it would be performing better than just looking at non-traditional data only. Totally. Um, again, uh, I'm going to end on the hardest question of all. You mentioned uh, this, and a few people raised this question. What about data privacy? Obviously, you said that people have to agree to the terms and conditions to access this. But how do, you, how do you try and ensure that they fully understand what they're signing up to and what the implications are? Or what's your experience to date might be a better question. Right. So, um, the, so as you mentioned, the process is actually very upfront. Uh, if we look at email data, if we look at um, Facebook data, then there will be a clear message that those are the permissions that we need from the end users to access um, and to actually serve them better. Um, we would also make sure that uh, they can always look at um, the privacy policy that we have and that the institution will have. I think that also brings us to a, uh, another topic, which is financial education. And how do you make sure to um, always have the uh, the applicants understand the trade-off they have to make uh, to actually access services that they would not necessarily have access to? And as far, uh, I won't go too much into the details here, but um, we have a wide range of security um, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, our solutions. We are ways to uh, adjust to the rules and regulations that um, 
we would see in, in, in different markets, whether they are internal to the partners or directly related to, uh, uh, to the country. So if we look at Indonesia, data cannot leave the country. If we look at some of the partners, everything has to happen on premise. So um, um, we would work to make sure that we can always comply to, uh, to all the rules and regulation and let applicants know as much as possible the trade-off they have to make to access better financial services. Fantastic. I apologize now for putting you that many questions in that short a period of time, but you did a fantastic job, Flo. Thank you so, so much. Next week, everyone who's still online, please remember we've got another great presentation from Flo looking at the KYC part of this and the IDMV. And I think that really is the icing on the cake in terms of understanding how this works. Because obviously, if you're going back to management at your banks and your financial institutions and suggesting this is a way forward, that you are, you're going to have a whole host of questions to get people to understand the potential, but also some of the kind of constraints and things you have to work around. I'm going to hand over to Tamara now to close up. But again, Flo, a big heartfelt thank you for agreeing to give us this amount of time. It really is appreciated. And Tamara, over to you. Thank you, Roy, and a big thank you to Florentin for presenting today. Uh, and just a final note, the webinar recording and materials will be made available at the AgriFin website within 24 hours. Uh, so be sure to visit agrifinfacility.org, uh, look under the webinars section, and you will find these materials, um, including some additional bonus materials and resources that have been provided uh, by Lendo. Um, at the end of this webinar, you will automatically be taken to the registration page to sign up for the second part of this two-part series. So uh, please do go ahead and get yourself registered. And uh, we'll see you again next week, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight. Um, be sure to uh, follow us on LinkedIn if you can. And uh, if you're not a member already, we encourage you to sign up so that you never miss any of our communications or anything about these exciting webinars, forums, and other publications that we release. Thanks, everyone. And we hope you have a lovely day. Take care. Bye-bye.